Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the hidden hand of economic sanctions. Last time, I told you that you can't judge whether sanctions are good or bad based purely on instances where sanctions were imposed. The reason you can't do that is because that is selecting on the dependent variable, and if you select on the dependent variable, you're going to get an invalid inference. And in this particular case, that inference is incorrect because of this hidden hand of economic sanctions. As it turns out, most of sanctions' heavy lifting is never actually observed. When sanctions are most useful, you never even have to implement them. You'll get the outcome that you want, and you won't have to do any dirty work in the process. And because of this, you're going to have an unfairly biased perception that sanctions are bad. So to see this, to understand why this is true, let's think about a particular interaction. Imagine that we have a good guy United Nations. This could be some other country that's imposing the sanctions, it doesn't matter. This is just the guy who is possibly going to impose sanctions on another country. And this is in fact a good guy United Nations. It most wants to stop evil countries from doing bad things, but it also prefers sanctions to no sanctions if bad things are done. In other words, this good guy United Nations only wants to reward good behavior and only wants to punish bad behavior. It's going to do the right thing, as it were, whatever happens with this other country. Now let's think about the other country. Imagine that this is an evil country, and by virtue of its name, evil country, its best outcome is to do evil things without being punished. And for this instance, we're going to see what happens if the country is tough. And what I mean by that is that it prefers doing evil things and suffering the punishment to not doing evil things. So it's tough in the sense that it's resistant to sanctions, perhaps because the leader is consolidated power and will not be harmed very much if sanctions are imposed. So this is just one particular set of assumptions. I've assumed that we have a good guy United Nations out there, and I've assumed that we have an evil country that's really tough. This doesn't, of course, describe every possible case, but you can imagine that this describes some possible cases. So imagine that we are in one of those possible cases. What's going to happen? Well, we can diagram it, and we can see what is going to result from this interaction. So the evil country can either do evil or not do evil, and then the good guy United Nations can respond by sanctioning or not sanctioning. And we have the payoffs listed below, as we saw from the previous two slides. We know how to solve these sorts of situations. We know how to figure out what both sides should do. We should start at the bottom and work our way up. So imagine that the evil country does evil. Well, the United Nations should respond by sanctioning because it receives a two in that case versus receiving a one if it does nothing. Again, the United Nations wants to reward good behavior and in this case, punish bad behavior. That's why it's going to prefer to sanction than not sanction in this case. Meanwhile, if the evil country does not do evil, the United Nations, good guy United Nations, wants to reward good behavior, and so it's going to choose to not implement sanctions because it's going to receive a four in that case versus only receiving a three if it sanctions this country that actually did the thing that the United Nations was trying to get it to do. So the good guy United Nations is going to reward the cooperative behavior from the evil country if the evil country does not do evil. So we know what the United Nations is going to do, which means we can figure out what the evil country is going to do here. If the evil country does evil, the United Nations is going to sanction it, and the evil country will receive a three. That's the red number there on the left. And if the evil country does not do evil, the United Nations will reward it for its good behavior and not impose sanctions. In that case, the evil country receives two. Well, because this evil country is so tough, it can resist those sanctions, and so it's going to prefer to do the evil thing and receive the three rather than not do the evil thing, not get punished, and only receive a two. So in this case, sanctions are going to fail. The evil country is going to do evil things. The United Nations is going to sanction it, but that's not going to stop the evil country from doing that evil thing. So here, sanctions are failing. Well, let's think about another instance. Imagine that we still have the good guy United Nations, and we still have an evil country that most prefers to do evil things without punishment. But now let's see what happens if this country is weak. And what I mean by that is that it prefers not doing evil things to doing those evil things and suffering the punishment. The consequence here, of course, being sanctions. Again, this doesn't describe every single case, but you can think of some situations where these sorts of preferences would apply for both the weak evil country and the good guy United Nations. And again, if we have these preferences, we can diagram it and we can figure out what is going to happen. 
So we are in the same situation as before, where the evil guy can do sanctions or not do sanctions, and the United Nations has to choose whether to, or rather, the evil guy can do evil or not do evil, and the United Nations can either sanction or not. The difference here is that we've interchanged the red two with the red three to reflect the fact that this evil country is now weak and it would prefer to not do evil and not receive sanctions to do evil and receive sanctions. So again, how do we solve this? Well, we start from the bottom and work our way up. The United Nations preferences haven't changed here. It still wants to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. So we know what the United Nations is going to do. If the evil country does evil, the United Nations is going to sanction. And if the evil country does not do evil, the United Nations won't sanction. Well, now we can see what's going to happen with the evil country. We see that the evil country, if it does evil, will receive a two. If it doesn't do evil, it will receive a three. So in this case, the evil country is going to choose not to do evil because it's weak in this case and it doesn't want to receive those sanctions. So the outcome here is that the evil country does not do evil and the United Nations does not punishment to punish it, I should say. So what we see in this case is that sanctions never exist. And yet sanctions did exactly what we would want them to do. The sanctions, the threat at least of those sanctions, convinced the evil country not to do evil things. So while it's true in this sort of situation, in these two situations that I described, when you see sanctions, it's going to be true that the sanctions are not stopping the evil country from doing anything. But it's not fair to say that the sanctions were worthless because in this situation where the evil country is weak, the threat of sanctions actually convinced the evil country not to do the evil thing, which means good guy United Nations got his way using the threat of sanctions without ever having to employ those sanctions. So sanctions are really useful here, despite the fact that you never observe them. So that is the hidden hand of economic sanctions. And we're going to see again how our perception of sanctions might be biased because of these sorts of selection problems where in these strategic interactions, you might see sanctions in the bad times, but not see sanctions in the good times. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.